that's a good way of thinking about it. And so because it's the birthplace of thinking, it's not that clear. It's doing its best to formulate something. That was Jung's notion, as opposed to Freud, who believed that there were sensors, internal sensors, that were hiding the dream's true message. That's not what Jung believed. He believed the dream was doing its best to, ex to express a reality that was still outside of fully articulated conscious comprehension. It was, because you think, look, a thought appears in your head, right? That's obvious. P bang, it's, it, it's nothing you ever ask about. But what the hell does that mean? A thought appears in your head. What kind of ridiculous explanation is that? You know, it's, it just doesn't help with anything. Where does it come from? Well, nowhere. It just appears in my head. Okay, well, that's not a very sophisticated explanation, as it turns out, you know? And so you might think that those thoughts, thoughts that you think, well, where do they come from? Well, they're often someone else's thoughts, right? Someone long dead, that might be part of it. Just like the words you use to think are utterances of people who've been long dead. And so you're informed by the spirit of your ancestors. That's one way of looking at it. And your motivations speak to you, and your emotions speak to you, and your body speaks to you. And it all does all that, at least in part, through the dream. And the dream is the birthplace of the fully articulated idea. They don't just come from nowhere fully fledged, right? They have a developmental origin, and, and God only knows how, how, how lengthy that origin is. Even to say something like, I am conscious, you know, that's taken... Chimpanzees don't say that. You know, it's been seven million years since we broke from chimpanzees, something like that from the common ancestor. You know, they have no articulated knowledge at all. They have very little self-representation in some sense, and very little self-consciousness. And that's not the case with us at all. And we had to painstakingly figure all of this out during that, you know, seven million year voyage. And I think some of that's represented and, 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 and captured in some sense in these ancient stories, which I believe were part of, especially the oldest stories in Genesis, which is the stories we're going to start with, that, that they were, that, that, that some of the archaic nature of the human being is encapsulated in those stories, and it's very, very instructive as far as I can tell. I can give you just a quick example. You know, there's an idea of sacrifice in, 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 in the Old Testament, and it's pretty barbaric, you know. I mean, the story of Abraham and Isaac is a good example of that because Abraham is called on to actually sacrifice his own son, which doesn't really seem like something that a reasonable God would ask you to do, right? And the God in the Old Testament is frequently cruel and arbitrary and demanding and paradoxical, and which, which is one of the things that really gives the book life because it wasn't edited by a committee, you know, a committee that was concerned with, with uh, not offending anyone, that's for sure. <laughs> So, so Jung believed that the dream was the birthplace of thought. And I've been extending that idea because one of the things I wondered about deeply was, you know, you have a dream and then someone interprets it. And 